Good morning, everyone. Uh, Council Good member. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for putting out. It's very. I'm just saying. It was it's a good helpful. leadership speaker moment. I appreciate oh, it. It's not <laughs> helpful, man. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Councilmember Jemani Williams, Chair of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. I'm joined today by Councilmember Kalos, Councilmember Cornegy, and Councilmember Ulrich. We are here to hold a hearing on intro number 106, intro number 1241, and intro number 1389. Intro number 106, sponsored by Councilmember Rose, would require building owners to post a sign that a portable ramp is available for access to the building at inaccessible building entrances where the ramp exists. Intro number 1241, sponsored by Councilmember Espinal, would require that new or renovated buildings that contain places of public accommodation include diaper changing tables that are accessible to persons regardless of their gender. Intro number 1389, sponsored by Councilmember Kalos, would create time frames for the removal of construction-related equipment, such as sidewalk sheds, when there is no active construction and would permit the city to correct unsafe conditions of exterior walls. I'm going to allow Councilmember Kalos to give his opening. I did want to ask uh, Guillermo Patino how the weather is over there. But how's it feeling? You all right? But, uh, we lost uh, Guillermo Patino, and it's been DOB's gain. He was over on this side here, a wonderful addition to our housing and buildings staff. Uh, but congratulations, and I hope you enjoy yourself. Councilmember Kellos. Uh, first, thank you to Chair Williams for your leadership of the Housing and uh, Buildings Committee. We've gotten so very much done under your leadership, including hearing every single one of my bills other than this one. But now this one is done, so I appreciate it. And uh, you've been doing. You, you've been keeping Guillermo and and Megan very busy, uh, and, and now as we negotiate all those bills into passage, you will continue to keep both of them uh, busy. Scaffolding or sidewalk sheds are like the once welcomed house guest that just never leaves. While we need them for safety during construction, that construction must happen immediately, and then it's time for that sidewalk shed to come down. Unfortunately, that's not how it works. Nearly 9,000 sidewalk sheds entomb over 190 miles of city sidewalks, and there are no requirements for building owners to complete needed safety-related construction work and then take the sheds down in a timely manner. Introduction 1389 imposes such requirements and, with exceptions for safety, forces the removal of scaffolding so our pedestrians can use the sidewalks unimpeded, our local businesses aren't losing money because of their storefronts are obscured, and people living and working in those buildings can rest easier knowing their building is fully up to code. Right now, residents and businesses have no other recourse than to make a 3-in-1 complaint. If the Department of Buildings is even able to send an inspector to check the scaffolding, a fine may be issued, but the fine and continual rental fees for the sidewalk shed are actually often cheaper than paying for the repairs. So some owners just choose to keep the scaffolding up. The worst of these landlords leave scaffolding up as a form of tenant harassment, often in rent-stabilized buildings. That's why we see scaffolding remain in place with no construction work ever being done for years and years and years. It's time to change the city landscape by removing the swarm of sidewalk sheds that blight our neighborhoods. This legislation is good for business, tenants, and pedestrians, and will improve our quality of life in the city. In my district, we had scaffolding up for two years at 340 East 64th Street and 301 East 95th Street and over three years at 349 East 74th Street. And those are just three examples in one council district. A building in Harlem has had scaffolding up for over 17 years and is almost old enough to vote, all without any work ever being done. This needs to change. Since I started working on this bill with Megan Chen, I've had many conversations with industry members about cost of sidewalk sheds versus construction, financial hardships from owners, and timelines tied to construction season. I'm looking forward to continuing those discussions today and coming out with a strong bill that is fair to all parties, but a bill that finally rids our sidewalks from unnecessary scaffolding. And just my personal pet peeve, getting dripped on when you don't know what it is that just dripped on you and it isn't even raining. <laughs> Uh, so I think we can all get this done. I think there's one other provision that's important, which is where a landlord needs to make the repairs but they can't afford it, the city would have to step in and get it done and then arrange a payment plan. And I think uh, that would actually ensure that our buildings were in great condition. And uh, I'm not HPD, but I, I know this guy named Bill de Blasio who wants to do affordable housing. and. 
if somebody needs to pay for their repairs, we might be able to say, hey, we'll cover that. Maybe we can make some of the units in your building that are vacant affordable. But uh, that's just an idea for uh, somebody much taller than I am. Uh, thank you very much. Depends on the hairstyle. Depends on the hairstyle. <laughs> You're also much t taller, but it, it wasn't for you. Okay. Just, just yeah, no, no. Um, I just want to thank Councilman Michaelos for his leadership on this issue. It's one of those, I guess, pothole type issues that that, that uh, don't generate enough attention, uh, but it's clearly something that we should be addressing. Uh, I definitely support the, in the intent of this legislation. Uh, the way I see it now is just cost effective for people to keep it up, and that's unfortunate because there's a, a bunch of ancillary effects that happen. So hopefully we can come to some kind of conclusion, get this bill moving. Uh, we've been joined by Council Member Espinal and Grudenchik, and I believe Kessim Espinal has some statements. I mean, I don't have an opening statement as witty as um, Ben Kalos, but uh, I'm, my, my bill is to, <laughs> yeah, my bill is to um, require uh, renovated bathrooms and new buildings to have diaper changing stations. Uh, I don't have any kids. I don't plan on having anyone <laughs> any anytime soon. But uh, it, this came after idea after I saw uh, on many occasions seeing fathers actually changing uh, their baby's diapers on top of the bathroom sinks, which I believe are unsanitary. And uh, I think that in this day and age when we're promoting equality across the board in all genders, and dads should have that, <laughs> that space to uh, uh, change their child's diapers as well. Uh, so, you know, I, th I think this will be um, uh, very important legislation. I know that uh, a few years ago, uh, President Barack Obama uh, actually um, did a federal order that would require all federal buildings to have diaper changing stations. And uh, there was actually a big movement um, in Hollywood uh, through some actors uh, to, to, to push for uh, this sort of uh, change and, and action across the country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Council Member. Another, uh, I think, very worthy bill. Uh, I'd like to thank my staff for the work they did to assemble this hearing, including Mike Toomey, my legislative director, Kevin Fagan, my communication director, Megan Chen, counsel to the committee, Jose Conde, policy analyst to the committee, and Sarah Gasolin, the committee's finance analyst. I'd like to remind everyone who would like to testify today to please fill out a, a card with the sergeant of arms. I just realized looking over here, the two people over there, Nick Smith and Gamero, used to work with or for me. Is it me? I just want to make sure. No? Okay, let me know if it is. I don't want to lose anybody else to the other side. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> oh boy, you know one of us might be able to change that very, very soon. <laughs> um, we're going to hear from uh, Patrick Riley, AC of External Affairs from the DOB. Uh, can you please raise your right hand? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? I will. You can begin. Thank you. If, if Guillermo speaks, Guillermo will be affirmed in. Are you, are you planning to speak? I don't know. Let's Good afternoon, Chair Williams and members of the Housing Buildings and City Council. I am Patrick Whaley, Assistant Commissioner for External Affairs of the New York City Department of Buildings. I am happy to be joined by um, our newly minted uh, Senior Advisor for Legislative Affairs, Guillermo Patino. I am pleased to be here to offer testimony on the bills before this committee today. Introductory numbers 106, 1241, and 1389. Introductory number 106 would require that a sign be posted at inaccessible building entrances indicating that a portable ramp is available when such a ramp exists. Since 2008, the New York City Building Code has required that all public entrances be permanently accessible to persons with physical disabilities. Thus, buildings constructed under the 2008 and more recent 2014 codes are already required to be accessible and would not be permitted to utilize portable ramps as a means of compliance with the code's accessibility requirements. The accessibility requirements of the code also apply to buildings built before 2008, version of the code, took effect whenever such buildings undertake certain alterations or change their use or occupancy. Therefore, buildings constructed after 2008, the 2008 code, took effect and the pre-2008 code buildings that undertook certain alterations or changed their use or occupancy, thereby trigger the accessibility requirements of the code. They must be permanently accessible and are not permitted to use portable ramps. Additionally, the American with Disabilities Act requires that places of public accommodation remove barriers to access even when no alterations or renovations to such places are planned. 
The department supports this bill as it would make it easier for persons with disabilities to access buildings that are not permanently accessible. We suggest that the bill be amended to specify that the requirements of the bill only apply to those buildings that are not otherwise required to be accessible by the code or any other applicable rule or law. Intro 12, introductory number 1241 would require that newly constructed assembly and mercantile, mercantile occupancies, both male and female occupants have access to at least one diaper changing station on each floor containing a public restroom. The department again is supportive of this measure as it would ensure that these types of occupancies, which include places like movie theaters and department stores, are family friendly. The department recommends that the bill be amended to reference ICC A117.1 section 603.5 which states the technical requirements for installing diapers changing stations. Next, I would mo like to move on to introductory number 1389. This bill would require the department to direct HPD or DCAS or another agency to perform or arrange for the performance of the correction of unsafe condi conditions of exterior walls where such conditions have not been corrected within 90 days or 180 days if the department grants an extension, such as through an emergency repair program. The bill also requires that sidewalk sheds be removed if the department determines there has been no work at the site for seven days. The bill also requires, ba requires barriers placed in a roadway to prohibit vehicular traffic be removed if there has been no work for a period of one or more hours. It also requires that contractor sheds or offices not placed on the street, not be placed on the street unless placement on the construction site is impracticable and such placement on the street complies with DOT rules. And finally, requires that temporary walkways for the public and barriers placed in a roadway to prohibit vehicular traffic be removed within seven days or one hour respectively if the department determines that there has been no work at the site. In order to ensure the safety and structural stability of buildings, owners must comply with Local Law 11 of 1998, which requires the inspection of the exterior walls of buildings which are greater than six stories in height. Owners of more than 14,000 buildings must submit the results of such inspections in five-year cycles. Following an inspection, which is conducted by a private, qualified, registered design professional, an inspector assigns one of three categories to the exterior walls of these buildings. Either they're safe, which means that there are no problems and that the exterior walls are in good condition, or they're safe with a repair and maintenance program meaning that the building owner will need to conduct repairs to keep the facade from deteriorating. And finally, unsafe, which means that there are problems or defects present at the facade that pose a threat to public safety. In cycle seven of the facade inspection safety program, which ended in 2015, and which was the last five-year cycle that was completed, there were 975 buildings in the unsafe category. So far in cycle eight, which ends in 2020, there are 912 buildings in the unsafe category. Under this bill, these buildings would be referred to HPD or DCAS for emergency repairs after 90 or 180 days if they have not completed repairs. While the department does not track the cost to owners to undertake facade repairs, anecdotally we have heard that the cost is significant. In some cases, owners opt to postpone facade repairs and simply renew permits for their sidewalk sheds which protect the public because it is more cost effective to do so. While the department agrees that there are sidewalk sheds in place for a period of time longer than it, is reasonably, than it reasonably takes to make the facade safe, we do not support shifting the burden, uh, burden of conducting facade repairs from owners to the city. From the department's perspective, even buildings categorized as unsafe do not pose a safety risk to the public once sidewalk sheds are erected. The city does not have a program to address facade repair and more importantly lacks the significant resources necessary to fund it. The city should continue to prioritize its limited resources to address immediately hazardous conditions. Turning now to the issue of sidewalk sheds. As of yesterday, there were 8,843 active sidewalk shed permits citywide. Nearly 25% of those sheds result from local law facade inspections with another 25 resulting from building construction and the remaining 50% resulting from general maintenance. The primary purpose of a sidewalk shed is to protect the public. 
For that reason, we do not support the provision in this bill that requires that sidewalk sheds be removed within seven days, a seven day time frame, if no work has occurred at the site. The bill provides an exception for keeping the shed in place if removing it would pose, uh, would pose a risk to pedestrians. In nearly every case, that exception would apply. If a sidewalk shed is up at a site, it is because the owner of the site has not proved to the department's satisfaction that the building no longer poses a safety risk to the public. From our perspective, it benefits the public for the department to assume the safety risk is still present until a building owner proves to us otherwise. The department understands that sidewalk sheds can have an adverse impact on the quality of life of building residents and for business owners and would like to work with our partner agencies and the city council to mitigate these issues. In fact, last year the department performed a sweep of all 7,700 buildings in the city with active sidewalk shed permits, permits. As a result of that sweep, the department issued hundreds of violations to address quality of life issues associated with sidewalk sheds, including um, accumulated garbage, dimmer missing lighting, graffiti, and so forth an attempt to make their presence more tolerable for New Yorkers who have to live with them on a daily basis. The department determined that 98% of the sidewalk sheds with active permits needed to remain in place to keep the public safe. Finally, the department believes that it's outside the pur our purview to require that contractor sheds not be placed on a street unless such placement complies with DOT rules and to ensure that temporary walkways and barriers placed, placed in roadways be removed in the time frames laid out in the bill. Currently, DOT regulates the placement of contractor sheds on, sh on the street, temporary pedestrian walkways, and the temporary closing of roadways. Additionally, the permits issued by DOT can last 30, 60, or 90 days, renewable as needed. Therefore, the time frames laid out in the bill would directly conflict with DOT's permitting scheme. Thank you for the attention, and, uh, your attention and opportunity to testify. Uh, we welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, seeing that this is m more of a bills hearing than an oversight hearing, I'm actually going to allow my colleagues who have bills uh, to ask questions first. I'm going to put five minutes on uh, for their first round, and then I will ask questions after. Um, Council Member Espinal, uh, if you have questions, no questions? All right. Oh, nice. All right. <laughs> uh, then I'll go to uh, Council Member Kalos, who I, I presume will have some questions. So just to be clear, so, so just to quote from your testimony, the department agrees that there are sidewalk sheds in place for a period of time longer than it reasonably takes to make the facade safe. Correct. However, in your testimony, you do not provide <coughs> a any, any methods or, or suggestions or solutions for taking this problem on. That's also correct. So certainly we understand that there are situations throughout the city where there are side floor sheds in place for longer for a longer period of time than it reasonably t takes to, to correct the situation on the facade. We recognize this as an issue and we are um, going to work with agencies and the council to find solutions to this problem. However, safety comes first, and we don't think an emergency pair repair program or removing sidewalk sheds from, si from locations that have unsafe conditions is the way to, to, to solve that problem. But we're actively looking into this issue. Um, we recognize it's a serious concern, and we look forward in the coming weeks and months in sharing with uh, the city council some ideas to address this problem. So in your testimony, you indicated there are four approximately Owners of more than 14,000 buildings must, uh, local law 11, okay, sorry, I'm doing a new thing where I'm trying to use less jargon and more language that somebody watching at TV who didn't fall asleep during our various opening statements and testimony will be able to follow. They're so falling asleep now, though. Go it's, ahead. it's true. 
So local law 11 requires folks to inspect the outside of buildings, and, and you may see those folks up looking at the brickwork, right? That's a fair characterization. Yes, yeah, certain types of buildings, seven stories or greater. Great. So there are 14,000 buildings that need to have their brick work on the outside of their building inspected. Once every five years, yes. It's based on a five-year cycle. So once every five years, those buildings, those 14,000 buildings within that universe require inspection. And then in your testimony, you indicated 8,843, there are 8,843 active sidewalk sheds, permits citywide. Uh, so when I did the quick math on that, that comes out to about 63%. So, so roughly two-thirds of all the buildings that are, have to have their brick work inspected because they're taller than six stories have a sidewalk shed up. Uh, to be clear, it's, it's, that's not exactly right. So there's the universe of these local Law 11 buildings, which is one issue, and then you have the permits that have been issued. The permits that have been issued aren't just limited to those buildings within the local Law 11 universe. It's actually broader than that. So you can get a permit for a, for a sidewalk shed for a whole host of reasons, not just because of the local Law 11 work. You could be doing routine maintenance. You could be actually constructing a new building. There are a whole host of reasons why you would be getting a permit for a sidewalk shed. A limited universe of that are these 14,000 buildings um, that are, are within the local Law 11 universe. Now, not all of those buildings require a sidewalk shed. Based on the engineer's inspection, the engineer will determine whether or not the building is, is unsafe or in need of some repair, and in those instances, a sidewalk shed would be required. Okay, so... If I do, in your testimony, you indicated 25% of the sidewalk sheds were for local law 11. So 25% of 8,843 is 2,210.75. And so when you divide that 14,000 by 2,210.75, it comes out to about 15.7%. So is that more accurate? I would say that certainly your, your point is well taken, that there is a, a large percentage of the local law universe who has an unsafe facade, who, are, who do have a sidewalk shut up, but have not commenced um, work to repair that facade. Okay, uh, and just uh, FYI for folks, you can, uh, I, I take questions, so that question actually came courtesy of uh, uh, the, the, the New York Post, but uh, uh, you can tweet me at Ben Kalos, and uh, you can tweet the chair at? Jemani Williams, if they can spell it. <laughs> spell it for them. I appreciate it. I'll spit it later. <laughs> no worries. Uh, okay. So along those, okay, so, so we, we, we understand that there, this is a, a big problem and it's something. Uh, can you talk to me a little bit about uh, what enforcement you can do and how the penalties work and how the liens work and why liens m may or may not be the best enforcement tool? Certainly. So there is a number of different types of enforcement actions um, that the department can take, and based on the violations that are issued, um, penalties, of course, would be, obsessed, would be assessed. The ranges of these penalties vary from as little as $1,000 to as high as $25,000. Some of the examples of violations that could be issued as it relates to the work that we're describing would be obviously failure to maintain the exterior walls of a building, um, failure to file the report that's required under Local Law 11, um, filing a late report. Um, if you have an unsafe condition, you're failing to, pr pr um, to file. You know, one of the things of note that's specifically related to the issue we're discussing here today is the way the law works today is if there's an unsafe condition on the facade, you have 90 days to correct that condition. However, you have the opportunity to request an extension from the buildings department for 90 days to, to keep going. And there's no cap on the amount of requests for extensions that you can ask for. So as long as the owner is demonstrating to the department's satisfaction that it's safe, there's a sidewalk shed in place, they have permits pulled, they're making efforts to correct those conditions, we will continue issuing um, an extension on fixing those conditions. However, if the owner fails to request an extension, they're assessed a penalty, and that penalty is $1,000 per month for their failure to um, request the extension and, and, and correct those conditions. In terms of liens, um, we've had this discussion with this committee and with yourself before. Uh, the, 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 the city's abil ability to attach liens for 
penalties resulting from building code violations is somewhat limited. For quite some time, it only really applied to one, two, and three family homes. Only recently, there are a couple of laws that enacted that expanded that somewhat. One applying to illegal conversions, the second that I believe was sponsored by you, that applies it to uh, multiple dwellings of a certain number of units with a certain number of total outstanding penalties. So as a general matter, um, with that exception, um, we do not have the authority to attach liens to any penalties associated with any type of facade issue. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, thank you, Assistant Commissioner. I, I just want to also make sure I'm clarifying. So you're saying the, the sidewalk sheds and the scaffolding that are on, on top of them, they, the way it's set up now, it's, it's less expensive for owners to renew the permits for a sidewalk shed than to make the repairs to the facade, correct? In some instances, that's correct, yes. How many, what percentage of those other instances? It's not, it's very difficult, if not impossible, for us to say. In terms of the cost of, of facade repair work, it obviously varies greatly depending on the scope of work, how significant the, the repair is. You know, we tried to, to do a, a look into our data. It's difficult to do because a lot of the, the scope of work is more than just facade work, ultimately, so it's hard for us to pull out just the facade work to arrive at um, what the cost would be. The, the best we can determine is certainly at an average, you're looking at um, $300,000 about um, for your average facade repair job. Keep in mind, though, that applies to all facade work, be it like the very expensive stuff and general maintenance. This bill speaks to only those unsafe conditions, and certainly unsafe conditions, you would reasonably assume that kind of work is far more expensive than your, in your sort of run-of-the-mill uh, maintenance work. So we, would, we could assume that certainly the cost to perform that work, to correct those conditions, to make those repairs, would be far in excess of the, you know, the close to $300,000 figure we arrived at. So if, if, if the cost of the facade work is not, if, if, it's not, if I don't fall in that category, what's another reason that I'd want to keep the sidewalk shed or scaffolding up? So the, sh the, the, the shed goes up and the scaffolding goes up if it's for this local law 11 work for unsafe buildings. Mm -hmm. If there's just general maintenance of a facade that needs to happen, you put that up. And if you're constructing a new building. Now, if you're constructing a new building or you're doing routine maintenance on your building, as a general matter, this is less of an issue because you have the resources in place to do this work. You're building your building. You're not going to sit on it when your building not being created. You have a plan in place. You have the resources in place. I think to a large extent, the, the concern that's being identified here that we're talking about relates to these local Law 11 buildings, and particularly the unsafe buildings or the buildings that aren't exact, somewhere in between safe and unsafe, that require the shed and, and, and so forth. So you believe that the, the ones that are up just for construction, they generally come down in a reasonable time, and the ones that are up are primarily the local laws that have to do with facade repair. As a general matter, I'd say yes, that's correct. Just want to mention we were we've been joined by Councilmember Rosenthal and Councilmember Mendez as well. I, I mean, there comes a time I don't know if this is that, but there comes a time where an owner may not have the capacity to own a building if they can't follow all the laws. So, at what what point do we make that decision? Obviously, I think the the um, sidewalk sheds and the and the, and the scaffolding do pose some some public safety issues in terms of navigating them, but as you mentioned, they do. Uh, we do want to address quality of life issues um, as well. And so, what it sounds like you were saying is that you recognize and acknowledge that there is a severe quality of life issue with the sheds remaining up, but we don't have the funding to attend to it. Is that correct? Most of that I would agree with. Certainly there's a problem here, and it's a problem that needs correction. As a department, as a city, we haven't really figured out what that is yet. Certainly as we go down this road, we need to be very careful in terms of solutions to this problem because sidewalk sheds are there for a reason. There are certainly quality of life um, issues associated with sidewalk sheds, but they're there for a reason. They're there to protect the safety of the public. And that is absolutely paramount. So when we think about ways to address this issue, it has to be seen through the lens of public safety and, and, you know, and protection of the public. So we don't want the sheds to come down if the public's going to be unsafe. We want the 
conditions to be corrected. So then now it's about how we make sure the conditions are corrected. I'm not sure if we should be allowing quality of life issues or I think some public safety issues. Additionally, maybe not as much as the facade, but definitely trying to navigate it. And you know, I don't, as was mentioned, you don't know what's tripping down on you. That's all uh, into consideration. That shouldn't be the the result of an owner who may not be able to uphold the building. And also now, it sounds like we don't have a way to figure out if that owner can afford to make the repairs or is simply deciding not to make the repairs. That's correct. It's very challenging for us to, 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 uh, to understand that. I mean, oftentimes with facade work, you know, it's a tremendous amount of work. And not only is it uh, quite expensive, but it's also quite time consuming. And in many of these buildings, say for like co-ops and condos, you know, a lot of these older buildings, masonry, masonry buildings, they have to establish a capital campaign to raise the money before they can even commence the work. So they have a local law 11 inspection performed. The inspection reveals that the, the facade of the building is unsafe or borders being unsafe. Obviously the sidewalk shed needs to go up right away and th that, those conditions need to be corrected. But in certain instances, monies, large sums of monies need to be raised to perform that work. And that makes sense. I don't know that inaction is the, the, is the answer. And now that makes sense that something may go over a year, two years. But we have a building that was mentioned that was almost 18 years. And so that, to me, is a long time of inaction. And so well, I think what we're good here at in city council is, is nudging that, that conversation. And so I just, Councilman Michaelos is also a good nudger. And I think this bill is, <laughs> is meant to push that. And so if there isn't a plan, I think we're trying to come up with a plan for you. And so I think it would be good to present a different plan or we got to figure out how to make this bill work because we can't leave these questions unanswered, which just means shed, sidewalk shed to stay up in perpetuity. That doesn't make any sense also. Regrettably, you're right. We, we don't have a plan. We need to create a plan. We are actively thinking through potential solutions, ways perhaps to create disincentives for owners to not perform this work. Um, it's a very challenging thing to do because there's a lot we don't know and difficult to find out. Um, we certainly, again, don't want to imperil the safety of the public. We are thinking through ideas, and we certainly welcome the opportunity to sit down with our partner agencies and the city council to sort of work through some of this stuff and, and come up with something that works. Uh, and particularly with NYCHA, um, do the sidewalk sheds and that are up there, they fall in the local 11 category, I assume? Correct. And have they said it's because they can't afford to make the facade repairs? I, I think the issues that we have as it relates to the issues we have, it applies the same to whether it's a city-owned building, NYCHA, or a private building. If, if, there's, if, there's a structure, if there's an unsafe condition with the facade, even a NYCHA property, the sidewalk shit has to come up, and capital funding needs to be provided to correct those conditions. I, I can't speak with specificity, but I think we all know this administration has devoted a significant sum of resources to correcting these conditions. Not so just that the, 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 the sidewalk shed comes down and it improves the quality of life of the residents, but again, more importantly, that the unsafe condition is corrected. But we are talking about, as we all know, a large volume of work. Um, and so it's a problem at NYCHA, at NYCHA buildings just as it is in other types of buildings as well. So I'm asking a specific question because it we have said that it's difficult to find out whether an owner has the shed up because they don't want to pay or because they don't have the ability to pay. And so it seems like we have a reasonable expectation to get an answer from at least NYCHA because we own it of which one it is. So I'm just saying is it that they uh, are not doing it or are they saying and that they don't have the capital funds? I, it's hard for me, obviously, to speak on behalf of NYCHA. I imagine, certainly, though, that it's a funding issue, but I, I can't say for certain. Oh, so there hasn't been a, an official conversation? I don't think there's a, a, a lack of desire to do this. Okay. I think it's just a question of getting the necessary funding to make it happen. All right, uh, still on 1389. Uh, of the sidewalk sheds permits issued in 2016, how many are still active now? Uh, there are 5,860 um, sidewalk shed permits that have been active uh, for a year. When was the sidewalk shed permit for 280 Broadway, not too far from us, issued? Two, uh, 280 Broadway is uh, the building, depart building department's um, headquarters. Yes, it is. <laughs> and, and, and yes, we, we, we do have uh, a sidewalk shed outside our building. 
It has been there since uh, August of 2008. We've had a shed in place on our building. Um, and I think 280 Broadway is actually, uh, unfortunately, a, a good example of the challenges that one faces in performing facade repair. It takes a lot of time to scope out the work, um, to you know get the necessary funding to make it happen. Thankfully, um, their work has commenced as of a few months ago on 280 Broadway, so we expect within, I think, a couple of years, and that's how long it takes to perform this work, um, that the work will be completed. So I, I am assuming you have spoken yourself. So the, the reason that you weren't able to do it sooner was because you didn't have the capital funds to fix the facade? I believe that's correct, yes. You believe it's correct, though? Well, I, I, ma I mean, I, I, I don't work in our, I don't really deal with DCAS directly, but I imagine that's the case. It was a question of getting the capital funding to perform the work. Did anybody ask for the capital funding? I'm sure that's correct, yes. They did ask for the capital funding? I imagine that. I, I imagine, you know, we asked for the resources to repair our floor. Besides, ultimately, it's a situation for DCAS, right? They own and operate a number of buildings. Ours is one of them. It's a city-owned building. So, uh, you know, they make the determination, ultimately, um, the schedule by which this work, which work, work occurs. I, I, don't, I don't recall um, getting... I went through several budgets as a housing chair. I just don't recall getting requests for capital funding to fix the facade of a DOB building. I don't. I can't. I don't have an answer to that. I'm happy to look into it further and get back uh, to the well, committee. Well, GovOps chair is saying that they have not. So okay. uh, th those funding hasn't come in. So you know, I just, I just want to be sure if people are just not making it a priority. I understand funding is an issue, definitely but uh, people would also have to prioritize it. And so this may be a case where a city agency has a facade on their building, did not prioritize it. And well, there are certainly always competing priorities for expense and capital monies. Where this specific issue ranked on that list, I can't say. Okay. What was the average length of time for completion of facade local law 11 work? What is the average length of time? So it, it varies greatly uh, depending upon the scope of work. And, uh, and obviously the ability to raise funds to pay for that work. Um, in our experience, it varies from as little as a few months just to work that can take a number of years, obviously. For other construction-related equipment for which DOT issues the permits, does, does DOB and DOT interact for permit issues? Uh, we do interact related to permit issues, you know, to the extent that work on a construction site requires um, work to happen off-site on the street of the sidewalk. Um, there is coordination between between our agencies. For example, if uh, you had to use a crane to install, say, mechanical equipment on the construction site, that crane will likely be situated on the street, and there needs to be a certain level of coordination between the department and DOT on the permitting for that crane. Um, and the way your testimony read, I assume that there were buildings that were in cycle seven that are still in cycle eight. Is that correct? There are buildings in cycle seven that were deemed unsafe um, that remain unsafe, yes, in this cycle. Okay. Thank you. I'm gonna have, I do have some additional questions, but I'm going to go back to my colleagues for five-minute questions each. Uh, Councilmember Grodenchik, Councilmember Rosenthal, and Councilmember Kellos. Just uh, if, if you weren't here, they are supportive of intro number 106 uh, with some changes. Um, I, I, well, I did want to speak. Have you spoken to the sponsor about the changes of 106? I have not had the opportunity, no. Okay. They seem fairly reasonable. I'm interested to hear what she has to say. Uh, and they're supportive of intro number 1241. They are not supportive of intro number 1389. We were also joined by Council Member Salamanca, Torres, and Rodriguez. Council Member Gordenchik. Thank you, Mr. Chair. When someone comes, uh, I own a building, and it's found to have an uh, insufficient uh, facade. Do they file for the shed first? Is that what the first plan of action would be? On an unsafe facade, certainly the first step is to put a shed up to protect the safety of the public, yes. And then you have seemingly forever, correct me if I'm wrong, you can go on and on and on, and we know that it's at least nine years at, at, uh, at 280. Um, and there's absolutely, according to your testimony that I heard, there's absolutely no mechanism to force people to perform this work. And I understand that there are... Um, co-ops or condos that might not have a res large enough reserve fund to perform unexpected work or, or a commercial building could be the same thing, uh, an owner that um, is in financial distress. The n no plans at all from the DOB, it's kind of depressing because, you know, these sheds are not just up 
Um, some of them are at schools, some of them are at um, commercial buildings, some of them are, you know, in other areas. It's far worse, I'm sure, in Manhattan than it is in, in my neck of the woods, though. But there, are, do you have an estimated date when you might have a plan? So it, it's a very uh, – so from the buildings department's perspective, first and foremost, as long as there's an unsafe condition on the facade, the shed needs to remain in place. But again, as we've discussed, there are certainly occasions where the shed is up for longer than, than is reasonable. Um, this is a very complicated situation because whatever we come up with, whatever we come up with to address the problem, we've got to make sure it's not impinging on the safety of the public. We're working through a number of ideas. Um, we're not quite there yet to share anything. We're working with our agency partners. We look forward to sitting down with the council. I don't have anything firm yet to share, um, but again, happy to sit down and look forward to sitting down with the council to discuss these issues and challenges and uh, see what we can come up with. But we do have some ideas that we're thinking through. It seems to me that at least some of the people that have these sheds up, um, I, I wouldn't say they're doing it on purpose, but there's, there's almost no recourse for the city if they don't take them down. They could be up indefinitely. I agree, and that's part of the problem. Um, what we're thinking about is creating, perhaps for lack of a better word, disincentives um, for folks to maintain their shed and not to fix these, cr these conditions in a reasonable amount of time. But it's a very difficult exercise to, to get there and understand what that standard and threshold is. But it's something we are thinking through. It's discouraging. It's like the guy in my district that has a, he's been building a house for 14 years. I mean, it's just imagine having, it's not the same thing, but they have a, yeah, it, they have a fence up around the property, which is, for public safety so nobody wanders on, especially children. Yes. But Ordinarily, we don't put a timetable on the amount of time it takes to perform the work, whatever kind of work it is. Our concern is that the work get performed safely. However, in certain instances, and what we're talking about today is one of them, there's this sort of ancillary impact, right? Sure. We're allowing folks to keep their sheds up that present quality of life issues for a period of time longer than it reasonably takes to fix the work. That's clearly a problem, and we need to figure it out. Your testimony indicated that Department of Buildings feels it would not be a good thing if the city, the city of New York, were to do these repairs. Um, and I'm sorry I missed part of your testimony, but it would seem to me that we, you know, we do demolish unsafe buildings. We do other kinds of work, and I'm sure that there would be any number of people who would be willing um, to do this work, and the city would slap a lien on the property, and that would move, thi um, move things along quicker is there any thought at all to the city doing this work so there's a or hiring somebody to do the work I mean, there's a big distinct distinction we think between the work that currently the city hires a contractor to perform versus what we're talking about here the work the city hires a contractor to perform is emergency unsafe work right we give an owner the opportunity to demolish their building because it's unsafe and if they fail to do so we show up and take care of it for them in this instance, we don't, we don't consider these buildings to be unsafe. Now, they do have an unsafe Well, they facade. are unsafe at some level, right. The facade well, however, is unsafe, which... However, the difference is there's a sidewalk shed put in place to protect the safety of the public. So the unsafe, immediately hazardous condition is addressed by the installation of the sidewalk shed. And so, therefore, we don't associate this type of work to be akin with the immediately hazardous emergency work that we ordinarily, as a city, refer to the emergency repair program. Last question. i got 17 seconds. Theoretically, I mean, the higher up you go, and if a section of, you know, the, the cladding of the building peeled away and it was three stories high, you could have a real big problem because the shed only covers the sidewalk and maybe part of the street. It could go all the way across to the other side of the street. Yeah, so there's requirements in the law that govern the size of the shed, how far it goes, and its length. If there were sort of conditions that you described that are unique, then we would then it would fall into the category of, of having to do perhaps. <laughs> okay. um, I'm, I'm sure it has. It. I, but I your point is well it. taken. There certainly are those unique circumstances where additional measures need to be taken. It just sounds. That's the exception. I can understand my colleague's frustration. Thank you very much, Mr. Wheeler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilmember Rosenthal, Kalos, and Salamanca. Thank you so much, Chair Williams. Um, Good to see you, um, Assistant Commissioner. Aren't you a deputy yet? No? Is deputy higher or lower? Higher. It's higher. It's higher. L last time I checked, I'm still All right, I'm putting in a good word to your boss. Thank you. um, I'm wondering, uh, 
last you say last year the department performed a sweep of all 7700 buildings with active sidewalk shed permits and then you issued hundreds of violations for quality of life which i totally get were you um how many buildings receive violations because one shed could receive several yeah, uh, unfortunately, I can get you the committee that information. I don't have it. It was okay. certainly a large number of violations um, representing a good portion of those buildings. I don't have an exact number offhand, but we can provide that to the committee. How many had been up longer than the three years it might take to get the work done? Well, again, every building's different in terms of its scope of yep. work, and it could reasonably take a few months or maybe even a few years, depending on the need to raise the funds to perform the work. Um, I, again, I don't have a specific number on those buildings that have been around for, say, longer than three years. Uh, but again, there's not a small number. We can provide the number of the committee, but I would say it's, I don't know if it's quite like 100, but it's in the tens, perhaps. But we'll, we'll provide that to the committee. Okay, that's helpful. How many do you think, it is, is one of the issues, um, enough staffing on behalf of DOB to get inspectors out to sign off on buildings in the facade work being done and the safety of taking down the shed? Uh, no, I don't think that's the issue. I think we're appropriately staffed. I don't know exactly what our service level is on these types of requests to get sign off on the work, but it's, you know, it's a matter of days at most. So that's not really what presents, you know, the, the large the large issue that we have here. So I think we're sufficiently resourced to perform those inspections to sign off on the work. I'd love to know the service level. I mean, the notion of days and maybe what the longest or among the longest has we can, been. We can certainly provide that. Great. And then can you drill down to know um, what's going on which, with each building or subset of buildings? I'm not, you know, I'm sure there's a proportion of the 7,700 that are solid you know, need to be there, no other reasons. But um, I'm wondering if there are, if there are ways to um, have criteria for taking down part of a sidewalk shed. In other words, when it wraps around a whole block, um, what can be done to take, you know, take down a third of it or, or two of the, Facades. That is also something we're thinking through right now. If there are circumstances where perhaps it's reasonable to not require as much um, of a sidewalk shed as the law currently requires, one of the particular challenges actually relates to NYCHA buildings. Because of the style and configuration of those buildings, the tower and the park, you sometimes have sidewalk sheds that extend you know, across from one building to another building. And you really need to have sidewalk sheds that, you know, based on it's, a, it's an equation that determines the sort of length of the sh linear length of the shedding. And based on the design and configuration of those buildings, it sometimes results in the shedding, there being more shedding than you really need. So that's also something we're thinking through as well. But I think the, the one thing we all obviously need to be mindful of is lo local law 11 and our, our whole facade inspection program is there to protect the safety of the public, and it, it works remarkably well. We traverse the city streets without fear of any part of a building falling on top of us, and almost without exception, that's the case. We've had some, a very small number of examples where there have been conditions. You council member, of course, are very yeah, much it's familiar criminal with criminal activity. Uh, that was in your district, which was certainly tragic. But local law 11, as a general matter, works exceptionally well. You know, and just to be clear, and I don't, speak for the sponsor, you know, just from my district's perspective, we love that. I mean, if there's one thing the Department of Buildings does exceedingly well, it's protecting the public. Um, you know, when when tall buildings go up and the, the area of the sidewalk sheds, I don't think that's being debated, and maybe we don't say it enough, but that's very well appreciated. Um, you know, I think what we're all juggling is the reality of sidewalk sheds that are up for a long time that affect, you know, retail, for example. Um, that's, that's what we're looking at, and that's why the notion of picking off pieces of it are attractive, like taking down part of a sidewalk yeah. shed. And that's, again, that's an approach we're considering as well. Appreciate that. Thank you. Member of Council Member Salamanca, and then Council Member Kittles. 
All right, thank you. How are you, Commissioner? Um, some quick questions. Uh, does the Department of Buildings have oversight of the sheds outside or the sheds that NYCHA developments have? Correct. They do. And does NYCHA, does NYCHA come and apply for a permit just like uh, a private building would do? Same process, yes. And, and do they apply for extensions? Certainly. And are they compliant? They're compliant in the sense that they are receiving, if, assuming the building has an unsafe condition, they request an extension. They, to, re, to receive the con, uh, extension, they need to demonstrate to us that the, the safety of the public's protected, meaning there's a, a sidewalk shed in place, that the sort of stability and the integrity of that sidewalk shed is appropriate, that they have permits to do the work, and that they're making efforts to correct those conditions. So, I mean, yes, as a general matter, they are um, compliant for sure. And does DO, does the Department of Buildings go out and inspect these sheds? And the reason I ask, I, I, have, I have the third largest NYCHA portfolio in the city of New York, and I have quite a few NYCHA developments that just have sheds, and they've been there for years. And there's issues about not enough lighting, there's issues about some of these sheds actually blocking the surveillance cameras. So there's a lot of a criminal activity happening uh, under within these sheds. And you know, um, my my concern in, in, in speaking with 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 NYCHA is when well when are you going to get the work that needs to be done done so that we can remove these sheds? And so my question to you is, how often does DOB go out and inspect these sheds? So as a general matter, our inspections are complaint-based. When we receive a complaint, we perform an inspection. On occasion, we do do sweeps where we actively look at all the active permits for sidewalk sheds out there. And based on what we see, we issue violations. NYCHA is a little bit unique. Um, we, we still, of do course- you, Do you give them violations as well? There, there wouldn't be any penalty associated with that. But if we see something, we'll let them know. I think specifically to your issues, if you want to share with me those locations, I'm happy to have somebody take a look, see what's going on, and then we can have a conversation with your office and NYCHA and see what, if anything, can be done. In, um, is NYCHA required to provide uh, buildings with a timeline as to you know, what capital work needs to be done that requires these sheds? Um, I don't think there's a requirement that they provide us with a timeline. I imagine they do. I don't, there's, the requirement for NYCHA as it relates to us and their permitting is to demonstrate to us that NYCHA residents are being protected by the condition on the facade. And if they satisfy that, they're, they're fine from our perspective. I don't believe they provide us with a timeline. I imagine there is a timeline. I don't believe they provide us with the timeline um, of that, that it will take to complete the work, or yeah, generally speaking. Okay, all right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Councilman McKittles. On this, Wait, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't want to just follow up really quickly on some of the NYCHA questions. Um, you said that you don't give any violations to NYCHA? I have to check and, and to see how it works with, you know, city-owned buildings. I, I believe we do issue violations, but I imagine there wouldn't be any penalty associated with those violations. Both of those things concern me. Um, one, if you don't give any violations, obviously that's a problem. So I really want to get an answer to that. And even if they're not being paid, which is bad, they should be on record that there's a violation that occurred there? Yeah, I, again, I, I'm, I'll, I will confirm that, but I'm pretty sure there is. There just wouldn't be a monetary penalty associated with that. I understand. I, whether I mean, it's another question of whether it's paid or not, I think they should be, the city should be treated like any other landlord. So if there's a monetary assessment that's assessed with the violation, uh, I think that should go along with it. So I'd like to know um, what's, you know, what's happening with that. And again, I brought up the NYCHA thing, and it's a, it's a good example of... You know, safety issues, because as was mentioned, sometimes the lights are out. It does cause crevices for people to do activity they may not otherwise do in the light. And lastly, just in general, when you have a, a bunch of people like that in that small area that feel neglected for various reasons and then look like they're neglected with sheds all over the place, it does set a kind of mindset and help a kind of mindset that we're trying to reverse. So I do think it is part of the, the public safety overall on um, the physical space that people live. Sorry, Councilman Kellos. In your testimony, you were skeptical of the impact of this legislation on local law 11 sheds. So let's start with 25% for new construction. So that's 2,210 sheds for new construction. 
Is there any reason why new construction should or would need to stop for more than seven days? Uh, certainly, there could be an, a number of reasons. And uh, if you can spend like no more than 30 seconds explaining why it would need to stop for seven days and why the sidewalk shed couldn't come down during that stoppage. I think it, it's hard to say specifically. I really, it depends on the site and the scope of work. It could be related could be to deliveries, work schedules. It could be some of the exceptions, obviously, that you outline in your bill. I mean, it depends on the specific site, but it wouldn't be unreasonable for a site to not, to, for there not to be activity on a site for a period of seven days. And more importantly, I don't think it's reasonable if there is no activity on the site for a period of seven days that the shed should come down. So when they come back to work on the eighth day, you're gonna put the shed back up? So I think I'd be eager to under, ha have a better understanding of what a reasonable work uh, stop and work on a site would be. I think everyone gets frustrated when they look and see a sidewalk shed, but no work happening. And seven days seems reasonable because you pick up the phone, you call 311, and they say, well, when did they stop doing work? And you're like, well, last week. I didn't see it for a week. If you say two weeks, whatever, it gets a little bit harder to do. But uh, DOB occasionally issues stop work orders. Occasionally it's at my request. Uh, but when work stops at a site for six months, uh, in that case, they can just, and, and during 2001, following 9-11, Work stopped all over the city as financing dropped off and all these sidewalk sheds stayed up. Why can't we just cap off those buildings, make them safe, put the netting up that you need to to keep what's in the building in the building, and then get the sidewalk sheds down if you're not doing actual construction anymore? So certainly uh, when there are slowdowns in the economy, we have, we've had a number of stalled sites throughout the city like you describe. Um, that's not really a problem today, thankfully. But I think you'll have to hear in part from you know, ownership and industry and contractors to get a better sense of their schedule and for the amount of time that work might not be occurring. I, I think in, you know, in our experience from where we are as a regulator, um, the, the situation you're describing isn't the situation that is causing the problem that we're discussing here today. But it, that, that's 25% of them. So I, I just want to move on. So the next one is 50% are for general maintenance. That's approximately 4,421. I'm going to ask the same type of question. Is there a reason why maintenance work would need to stop for more than seven days and a reason why the sidewalk shed could couldn't come down when that work has stopped and then go back when they need to do more? I would, I would give you the same answer. It really depends on the scope of work. I think there are reasonable situations where work could stop for seven days. And again, moreover, I don't, I don't think it's practical to go through all the work, time, and expense to remove a sidewalk shed only to put it back up maybe on the eighth day or a couple of days later. What it, so, so what if it was six months? I think it's something to consider. I, I, get, I think the, the universe that you're discussing represents the minority of the universe we're talking it's about 25 here. 25 or 50%. Of the, of the shed permits, but we're not discussing whether or not those sites are not active, right? The sites that are not active routinely are the local Law 11 sites, but the sites that are doing maintenance work and are new construction, mm -hmm. not in every instance, but ordinarily, the work's occurring so, on a reasonable so, schedule. So I don't know if you've been to law school or if you're an attorney, are you? Or? I am not. So you've been giving the, the very lawyerly answer of it depends. So let's separate how long work takes because of work versus funding. So if building contractors were to file a work plan with a timeline, does DOB have the expertise to review the work plan and timeline to see if that is reasonable? Um, that gets to one of the things we're considering as a department to help address this issue. So one of the things we're thinking about is exactly what you're describing, and we're thinking through our means to uh, perform that evaluation. Okay, so it looks like uh, I may have stumbled, uh, or perhaps uh, something we were probably both thinking about at the same time, of having folks file a work plan and then have DOB approve it, and if they don't hit their work plan, then some sort of mechanism to get that sidewalk shed down. Uh, along the same line, so for funding. So I understand that uh, DCAS has never asked me, I oversee them as chair as the GovOps chair, they have never actually asked for funding to fix your facade at the DOB building, which has been up for almost a decade, and that's a problem. Uh, if I may continue. You can choose that question. But, sure. Uh, so on the funding piece, uh, 
I, I'm not sure exactly, and Guillermo may know just as much as I or Megan, uh, to the extent HPD or DCAS wasn't interested in doing the work themselves, as I open, shared in my opening, and I'm not sure whether or not we can direct HPD to make funding available, but uh, if folks are having trouble arranging funding, uh, the federal, state, and local government all have uh, created precedents where we make money available for folks to borrow, uh, whether it's to buy a new home, whether it's to build affordable housing. Uh, and so I guess the question is, uh, do you think it is a wise investment of the city resources to provide funding to building owners that may be responsible but just can't get to the borrowing window or can't afford it to be able to do the work that's needed? Uh, to provide the subsidy or even unsubsidized. We can borrow at a lower rate than most anyone else can and uh, get that work done and perhaps, perhaps say, well, if you have vacant units in your building, we'd love those to be affordable now. Uh, so I work at the buildings department, and that question is a little bit outside of my scope of expertise. Um, I'm happy to take that back and share with my colleagues. Well, well to the extent HPD and, and DOT were in this legislation, I think it would have been appropriate for them to be here to speak to that specific question, which we've been posing to them for quite a while. Uh, I am done on this round of questions. Thank you. Do you have additional questions you want to ask as well? I, I, I do. Okay. Um, thank you, Council Member. Um, well, I might as well no, let's go to intro 106. I just have a, a few more questions on these bills. Does DOB issue violations for accessibility requirements? We do. If so, um, how many violations did DOB issue in 2016 or year to date? And what are the penalties associated with violations of accessibility requirements? So we don't receive many complaints, very few um, actually related to accessibility requirements. In 2016, um, we issued eight violations. Year to date, 2017, we've issued three violations. Um, in terms of the uh, the penalties, um, they range from $300 to $1,600. Sorry. Does DOB work with the Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities for enforcement of accessibility requirements? Certainly, we do. Um, they refer complaints to us as well for enforcement. For intro number 1241, does DOB issue any violations issued for failure to have diaper changing accommodations? And if so, how many did you issue in 2016 or year to date? We currently do not issue any violations because there's currently no requirement that there, these be, be in place. So presumably if this bill becomes law, we'd have the authority to do so. Thank you very much. Um, just back to 1389, I did just want to make clear. So, what you're saying in terms of contractor sheds is that you do not have the authority to do it. I was wondering. Yeah. So, as a general matter, in most instances, um, the contractor shed or contractor office is located on the site, on the actual construction site. That being the case, it's certainly something we're aware of and we govern and we regulate. There might be very limited instances where the shed needs to be located off the site because it interferes with construction operations. Therefore, the the shed would be placed off the building site, likely on the street, and that would be subject to DOT regulations and permitting. All right. Thank you very much. Um, Councilman Kalos is not here. 
We did say he had some additional questions, but I have no more questions I can think of right now. So hopefully you will follow up uh, with Councilmember Kellos and his Certainly. additional questions. I do believe that we want to get someplace real with this and perhaps codify what that is. Um, but by the way, with the seven days part, is it the theory of it coming down if there's no stop work orders, or is it the time frame that was suggested here? I think, well, from the department's perspective, again, as it relates to sidewalk sheds, they should not be coming down as long as there's an unsafe condition on the facade. But specifically as it relates to seven days, every operation is different. And there might be reasonable circumstances why there is not work occurring for seven days. Moreover, the bill requires the buildings department to, to show up on two lo at two separate times within those seven days. And if at those two instances we don't see work occurring, then we require the shed to come down. That seems impractical and unreasonable to us. But again, that, that's the time frame. That's why I'm trying to expand it out. Obviously, if there's unsafe conditions, that is one thing, and that makes sense. And I understand you said this is a smaller universe, but there may be a universe of people who aren't doing work, and the shed is up. And so I want to see if there's a time frame issue or you just feel it should be up for some of So as it relates to the local law 11 buildings, which again, are most, most of the buildings we're talking about are those, in pretty much every instance, it's an unsafe condition and the sidewalk shed should, should not come down. There are those other types of buildings where it might be just maintenance work or new construction where it was suggested maybe that seven days isn't reasonable and should be something more than that. What I would say, those buildings aren't really the buildings we're talking about here. To the extent that they are, it's something to think about and see what would be reasonable. I don't have an exact number offhand. From my perspective, seven days doesn't seem like enough, but I imagine there are others who might want to weigh in on that as well. All right. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, Michael Wolf uh, from Midborough and Rebney and Corham uh, from Rebney who are up next. Can you please each raise your right hand? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony for this committee and to respond honestly, honestly to council member questions? I do. I each have two minutes to give your testimony. You can begin in order of your preference. You gotta press the button. Here we are. Good afternoon, uh, Council Member Williams and the, the Committee on Housing and Buildings. My name is Carl Hum. Um, I am the Senior Vice President for Management Services and Government Affairs at the Real Estate Board in New York. Part of my portfolio is um, handling uh, re the residential managers, developers, and owners um, who are members of REBNY. Um, part of that is um, the Residential Management Council, um, who is uh, actually chaired uh, by the gentleman uh, to my left, uh, Michael Wolf, who you hear from very in a, in a short while. Um, but the Residential Management Committee, uh, Council rather, um, represents developers, owners, managers of the city's brand name residential buildings throughout the five boroughs and beyond. And collectively, when they heard about this bill, um, there was an ex a, a collective uh, uh, concern over this bill, um, and, with, uh, and particularly at the intent of the bill. Um, the committee feels that uh, the bill is well-intentioned, but unfortunately there are too many unintended consequences. Let me make this very clear from the committee's point of view, is that no one likes sidewalk sh sheds. Um, there is no incentive to keep these sheds. Um, it is something that they feel is an eyesore and that, that has, has caused many complaints for their residents and for their tenants. Um, however, in regards to dealing with the sidewalk sheds, there are often delays that are experienced from whether it be from the City of New York, from the DOB, landmarks, uh, or, what other, or what may have you in other city agencies. Additionally, as Assistant Commissioner Whaley had referenced, there could be also financing issues with regards to um, uh, carrying out the repairs that are required under Local Law 11. Again, the committee feels that this is a well-intentioned bill, but the unintended consequences are, are too great. And it, it just I uh, want to point out, in Com Commissioner Whaley's uh, testimony, he noted that in many cases, in fact, 98% of the cases, 
of sidewalk sheds, 98% of them could not come down because of unsafe conditions. And that leaves 2% of all the 8,800 some odd uh, sheds that are out there. So you're really targeting 176 sheds with this piece of legislation that's going to affect the entire city. So that's a great example of a very blunt instrument being used to kill what seems like a fly. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Michael Wolf. Um, I wear two hats um, this afternoon. One is the co-chair of the Residential Management Council of the City of New York, as well as the owner of Midborough Management that represents about 120 buildings, many of which are in uh, the sponsor's district, as well as other council members. And I do have sidewalk sheds up at the current time. Um, I, I assure you that none of my clients and no building that I know of wants a sidewalk shed up ever. Um, it's certainly necessary to protect, protect the public, uh, passers-by. Um, sidewalk sheds breed um, excessive dog urine. They breed um, unofficial uh, places of um, homeless, they become a homeless shelter at times. Um, we understand why a sidewalk shed would be a nuisance to someone especially to retail, people on the second floor. What we've done in our buildings is we're trying to raise the height of some sidewalk sheds to be under a window or above a window to allow light into a person's apartment, put signage up for the retailers, to put clear panels or mesh panels as opposed to solid wood panels so people could look through the shed but still provide safety. Um, I actually printed out a 1989 article. It was in the New York Times. And the New York Times article said, those stay forever sidewalk sheds, or bridges, they call them. The actual term is sheds. And the reason why I printed this article is because one of the buildings that I, I started managing approximately 30 years ago is referenced. At that time, uh, the commissioner, Department of Building Commissioner, Mr. Smith, proposed a one-year um, uh, uh, period for a sidewalk shed to remain with a renewal for one year and then one-year periods thereafter. The reason why seven days is certainly not um, a reasonable amount of time, with all due respect, is that certain things happen. If you have an unsafe condition, you may be in a landmark district. You may have to get a mold made. You may, may have to order materials. You may need an assessment. Um, and then also defining what no work means. And we're concerned that if there's a rush to remove a sidewalk shed, it will lead to, lead to substandard work. May I continue? You can finish your statement. Okay. Um, it, it could lead to substandard work. It could lead to people cheating, which would then put the pedestrians at risk. Somebody may be in such dire straits financially that they, do not, they, that they rush to remove a sidewalk shed just to comply with code and avoid fines, but yet they open the public up to, to, to unsafe conditions. Um, other things that... that uh, 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 thank, you, thank you for the testimony. I have a couple questions, so you might be able to sure. continue doing that. But first, um, residential management, what was it you... Do you chair or? The, the Real Estate Board of New York's Residential Management Council. Residential Management Council. And what's the relationship to, to Rebney? It's a sector of Rebney um, as they have a brokerage division. Um, and this is, our, our council are owners and operators and third party managers of real estate in, in the city, um, probably thousands of buildings. It's a subset of our membership okay. that gets together. Is that like a subcommittee or is it? Is it it's, uh, they're called the council, yes. Yeah, so it is a committee. Okay. Will. Um, so, so, Mr. Holm, I just wanted to mention that we're not only targeting the 179 buildings you're referencing. We actually are targeting like, all of them. I think we're trying to figure out which ones are up because owners can't afford and which ones owners don't want to do it because it's just cheaper for them to keep up. And so we do need at some point for those sheds to come down. And it, uh, We agree that they shouldn't come down if they are not, if it's not safe to bring them down. But in perpetuity is not the answer. And so to both of you, how do we figure out, and you guys have more access to owners' uh, books than we do, but how do we figure out if someone is keeping up because it's cheaper to keep up or because they really can't afford so that we help them access financing? Because you mentioned a few good reasons as to why uh, it would be a nuisance, and there are additional reasons as to why it's a nuisance. So it's not something that we can just keep saying it's unsafe, it's unsafe, without addressing the core issue. I thought one idea I had was that the Department of Buildings changed the procedure for Local 11 filing where you could upload your compliance. And one thought I had was that perhaps if a sidewalk shed was up for more than X period of time, that that owner or that management company or whoever the responsible party was, the registered managing agent for that building, could upload a contract with a vendor 
to prove that, that there is a contract out for the work to proceed. Sh you know, short of that, you, you, you don't know. So you could put up a shed, pull a permit for work, and never so do wait, it. just for clarity, yeah. that's for, and that sounds good for the ones that were saying no work is being done. So that sounds like a good possible solution, but it doesn't answer the question of ones that are up because it's unsafe, not necessarily because no work is being done. Well, the ones that are unsafe is it really is w what is the unsafe condition? So I can, I can give you an example, if, if you don't mind. So I, I have a shed up in your district currently on 95th Street. And we have not only a shed, but we have pipe scaffolding. So the building is in a cocoon. It's in a screen net. No one's happy. And we were waiting for two uh, terracotta stones to be made. And because so much work is going on in the city as the buildings are getting older, not, not younger, the, the um, molds take anywhere from four to eight weeks, or the, or the terracotta uh, product that we're looking for, to comply with landmarks. The pieces came um, incorrect. So now we have to go back to the mold company. So now I have my shed up for that much longer when everyone wants to shed down, including us, the, the building, the board, um, and now we're waiting for that to occur. I think one thing that could help some of the sheds come down um, sooner is perhaps look at you know, what the guidelines and requirements are for sheds. So some buildings have either what I call a moat around the building or they have large garden areas that maybe could be fenced off as opposed to a sidewalk shed. So we have, if we have very little work or there is no pedestrian traffic in a certain area, then we could limit just how much sidewalk shedding we have. Again, your example, you gave a good example of why it stayed up. And so I'm really trying to attack the so heart of... How do you get it down? Yeah. Well, no, well, your, your stayed up because there was work being done and I understand that there could be work that postponed it. But no one is getting to the cost issue. And some some of these are up because they either don't want to pay the cost to fix the facade, or they have financial burdens and, and unable to pay for it. And I'm trying to figure and, out. In some of those instances, and I think that um, Assistant Commissioner Whaley had pointed it out that some of these instances they are co-ops um, that are self-financed and. You know, they go through the local law 11 inspection, and at that point, figure they are they are um, at a point of discovery that repairs have to be made, and a um, a a, ca a financing campaign has to be undertaken, whether it be through self-assessment um, or whether it be looking for um, loans in the market. And as you know, um, you know, self-assessment is a um, sometimes a long task with regards to trying to get it past, tr for, trying to get it passed through um, co-op boards and also convincing other residents of it. Let me just ask another question: Do you think that there are some owners taking advantage of the fact that they can keep this up and it's cheaper than opposed to paying for? The facade repair. I, I'm sure there are. It's no different than when Local Law 11 first started, that owners ripped cornices off in decorative areas of a building, which really, I guess, landmarks expanded. So I'm sure there are people doing that. But from our perspective, I'd rather have an owner putting up a shed, not doing work, unfortunately taking advantage till we figure out how to, how to motivate them to take it down sooner, than for them not to have a shed and have something fall down and obviously kill I understand. Them. I just and want to know if you had ideas. I, well, I agree with figure you. figure that out. Councilman, yeah, I mean, I mean, there's always going to be, with every law that you put out there, there's always going to be people that are going to try to gain the system. And so the point I was trying to make earlier with regards to who is this going to affect, what is this going to affect this bill, you know, I, I look at um, Assistant Commissioner Whaley's testimony who says, gives us two facts. I mean, one is that there's 8,843 active sidewalk sheds citywide, right? So we're talking about that's a very defined universe of how many sidewalk sheds there are. And then also in his testimony, he says that 98% of the sheds out there are up there for a reason, because of safety reasons. So that leaves 2%. So 2% times 8,843 is going to give you 176 No, no, but this is where we disagree. You're you're not acknowledging that we're trying to actually deal with those unsafe buildings. Oh, I know, I know, yeah. I, I do acknowledge it. So, but I'm saying that the, you're, I'm, I'm saying that the the instrument that we're using, uh, namely a piece of citywide legislation, that's going to affect all owners, such as Michael, such as er everyone else in the residential management council and beyond, when you're really trying to affect 176 sites. No, but we're not. I just want to be clear that we are trying to affect all of the sidewalk sheds that are up for a particularly extended long time period some of which are the 2% that you spoke about, and the others are 
people who have them up because it's cheaper to have them up than to make the repairs. Right, but they're all within the universe of active sidewalk sheds, and that's what's because counted by the I, 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 I applaud no work, and then the city comes in and may do some work to get the unsafe condition removed and the sidewalk shed down. The mm -hmm. question is, how do we define what that period of time is? And that's certainly subjective. However, I, I, uh, however, you know, if you had an unsafe condition and a building doesn't look a little 11 study, the shed may go up. You have to do specifications, file with the city, wait for land walks, wait for DOB. So, you know, if I just had it off the cuff, think what would be an unreasonable time is more of a six-month window, not a seven-day window. I understand. Uh, and uh, I'm going to go to my, my colleague for five minutes' worth of, of questions. Mm -hmm. I just, I just want to just keep reiterating that we, we are bouncing around the fact that we got to figure out how to get the repairs made and not excuse owners who can pay for the repairs to get made to not making the repairs, and if there are uh, owners who are financial burdens, maybe we can guide them uh, to some products that can assist. But the answer is not just to keep the sheds up. Uh, in we, 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 we agree, and we, 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 are, we are here and ready to, to, to find, a, find an answer with you. Uh, Councilman Michaelos. Could I come meet with the Residential Management Council with our uh, committee staff and, and the, even our chair, if he wishes to join, to discuss this specific problem. We would welcome your attendance and your participation. Our, we meet every third Wednesday of the month. I, I will be there this third Wednesday of the month uh, um, in, in November, if that is we acceptable. Actually, well, you know, no, actually, we, yeah, we take exception. Yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely, yes. November if could, 15th. If you could please pass on to your leadership and your lobbyists that if council members request to meet with you, that it shouldn't have to happen at a hearing. I've been hoping to sit down with Rebney for years and uh, on this specific topic. So I, I welcome this and I will well, see you on the Well, Councilman, I, I'll, I'll give you my personal content information after my appearance here and make sure that if you're not, if, you're, if your phone call's not being returned, please give me a call. I'll give you my cell phone. And, and mine as well from our perspective or yeah. we, we feel just the opposite. We would love to have you. Perfect. Uh, I, I love the idea of fencing off an inaccessible area. I think that would also be very uh, helpful for NYCHA because a lot of those areas are open space areas but not supposed to be used. And I think it would change quality of life on the first floors and second floors where there are units. Uh, so I just want to speak to the location at 95th Street. So I guess the question is, so you were waiting for terracotta. So you found that the terracotta was loose. I imagine you removed all that terracotta that was loose. Is that correct? Yes. So then the question is, how much would it have been to take down the scaffolding for four to eight weeks? And in this case, 16 weeks, which was four months. And then would it have even been possible to work with the city or DOT or DOB to just say, you know what, putting back in the terracotta is a one day job or, or however long it takes and we will just corner off that section of the sidewalk so that we can go up, put it in and, and what have you. So we're trying to do that. In fact, I found out about this um, wrong mold issue last week. So what we're doing is we're, we're trying to, to see behind the scenes, we're going back to the contractor and saying, this is your fault. We want to take down the shed, take down the pipe, hire a boom truck at your expense and come back and put up the terracotta. So we're trying to, to, to work that out over the next couple of weeks to get that removed. We are, to your point. I, and my constituents on 95th Street now know I'm doing a great job for them. But I guess the question is, yeah. how can we get folks, how do we change the scaffold law and even local law 11, which I heard from our representatives from RSA, mm -hmm. so that it isn't this, this giant, uh, I, I would say, sledgehammer where something goes wrong, you have to put the scaffolding up, even if you don't necessarily need that, you just need to go up with the boom truck, take the offending material out and then get it down and then come back later and fix it. One thing you could help us with possibly is that if we complete a job today and we file with the DOB that the job is done, we want to remove our scaffold, it could take anywhere from 30 to 90 days before we get approval to remove the shed. So, and, and not to poo-poo the DOB, but everyone's busy. The other issue that we have is that landmarks have are understaffed and have so many files that to get a landmarks permit to proceed with work as well could take months as, in, in, as well. So, so let's up. take these suggestions and say that DOB and LPC have seven days to respond to a request to inspect and take down the scaffolding. We actually met with DOB at Revney mm -hmm. and they were going to endeavor to do a 30-day or less window. Um, 
clearly. I'll start with seven. That would be fabulous. Now then, the next question, which we were a little focused on, so I, I think we're all on the same page. Uh, so have you ever had occasion where you hire a contractor, they come in, they do the demo, they do the demo quickly, and then they disappear for days, weeks, or months before you can get them in to come back and finish the job? Not typically in these jobs. Not, not in my company, not in my experience that often. I, you will be my GC moving forward. No, uh, uh, that, that is incredibly impressive. So have you had occasion where work stopped for seven days after you Absolutely. hired? Absolutely. And sometimes work stops because you find a condition you didn't anticipate. Let's say, for example. So, so what's the reasonable amount of time where if it's more than, is it two weeks? Is it one month? At what point of like a work stoppage is it, you know what, we should really take it down, like for instance in this terracotta situation where you're waiting four to eight weeks to get it back? Uh, I think that in, in the vicinity of four to, four to seven months is probably reasonable at the top of my head. Because every job is different. I'll give you a perfect example. Wait, I'm, I'm sorry to in interrupt just sure. because I have 10 seconds. So I guess it's hard for me to wrap my head around having to wait four to seven months for work to happen. Uh, my, my feeling is it, it's somewhere in days or weeks of if, if you need more than a certain amount of time, then it's, it's reasonable to say, okay, let's just get the scaffolding done. And since you have the expertise, how much does it cost to take the scaffolding up and put it down? And is this a, a, through every single vendor or are there vendors that are less expensive for that? Industry standard, if I give you an average, about $130 a foot to put up a standard size shed that's for the erection, dismantling, and three months of rental. So keeping it up is inexpensive. The putting it up and taking it down is really where it has an adverse effect on the co-op board or the owner. That's why it's, it's much less expensive to keep it up while you're waiting. And, and the unfortunate reality is there's so many different reasons that could stop a job. And I know we're focusing on those that either can't afford it, don't want to do it, or are trying to do the cheap way out, but it really would make the people that can afford to do it, that are waiting for molds or steel to be made or special inspections, they will suffer because of the minority that, that are trying to, to beat the system, if I can call it that. If you went to a scaffold company and said, I want to put up the scaffolding for a week, get it back down, and then put it back up when I have to do the work in six or seven months again for another two weeks. Same price. It doubles. So uh, just uh, has that has this been reported to the attorney general's office or another piece? Because as, as an attorney, yeah. if, if my rate for two weeks of work was the same as seven months, I, I would get disbarred. So there seems to be some sort of, there's something wrong with the market that doing it right is more expensive than doing it wrong. Well, it depends on right. right from the standpoint of quality of life and the residents that live there. Um, some feel leaving it up is, is right, but to remove it for the, for the first floor and the second floor residents, because the, the, the reality is nobody else cares except for the noise, right? It's the people on the ground floor and the people on the second floor that are really much more affected by it. All right, uh, thank you, Council Member, and thank you for your answers. I, I do just want to add, while we, uh, we all agree that we want to make sure we're getting at people who are trying to, to game the system, as you said, also want to get to the people who may need some fi financial assistance. But I also think, as I think my colleague is trying to point out, there has to be a time period where it has to be in the course of doing business, of taking it up and taking it down. I mean, seven days might, might not be it. You know, 12 years is probably too long. So we have to find something where it's going to, it's just going to add to the cost for the betterment of the people of the city of New York, particularly people who, like NYCHA is up for decades and decades. Uh, we had one here up for 20 years. That, and that's ridiculous. So there has to be additional costs that are going to be incurred. If it is not safety and it is about a waiting period, then we, we, gotta, we have to figure that out. If I could add, if, if a um, registered architect, licensed engineer is involved, which most of these jobs are, at least the larger ones, they could we could also submit under their license on their letterhead an affidavit or some form that says what, how long this job should take and that they are working on it. So that, that would probably remove a lot of this, that if somebody did hire something like that, that where the license was on the line, they would at least say, I'm dealing with this property at this address, here's what we think the scope of work is and here's what we think the timeline is. And this way you could see there's actually somebody that, that is sincere about completing the job. But I, but I do anticipate um, 
if, if the shed has to be removed and put back up and that cost burden will now be distributed amongst co-op owners, renters, owners, I think that the complaint level, if, if we want to focus on that for a second, will be much higher than a shed being up in different areas for perceived too long of a period. All right. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. We have uh, one more panel. Uh, Kevin Dogan. Dave Frederick, Bell G. Zanin, Andrew Riggi, and Robert Bookman. Is Kevin Dogan here? Yeah. Uh, Dave Frederick. Dale Frederick. Sorry, Dale Frederick. Bell G. Zanin. Okay. Jump up, go, yeah, first. go first. Go first. Go first. Go All right. Okay. Uh, I saw Andrew Riggi. And Robert Bookman. Thanks. Okay. I'm telling my colleague that he doesn't have to come. Yeah, that I'm going to go first. <laughs> <laughs> Can everyone please raise their right hand? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. But you just have two minutes to give your testimony. You can give uh, the testimony in order of your preference. It sounds like uh, you were giving the parent uh, the benefit <laughs> of going first. Um, oh. <laughs> My name is Bill Gisanan. I'm uh, uh, a resident at 51 Walker Street um, in 10013. And I'm also um, on the condo buildings board. And we've had a sh our neighboring building, 49 Walker Street, has had a sidewalk shed up for nine years now, 2008. And um, the building is it's clearly deteriorating the facade and it's obviously for safety issues and so um, residents have filed complaints over the years our building management has inquired with a representative of the um, building owner to find out when work would start every year um, we are told that oh yeah we're going to start work now um, occasionally complaints are filed when the uh, permits expire and um, it's just being extended so um, since we've been hearing the same thing for all these years, it's pretty clear to us that um, this is one of those instances where the owner just um, doesn't want to do the work because it, it's, it's been very long and, um, and you know, we've heard the issues that have been talked about. It's a landmark building. It will be extensive. Um, so for us, I've attached photos. I mean, this is, um, the scaffolding shed actually stretches into our entrance. People lock their bikes up so that you have to actually get around um, to, to enter our building. There are people sitting day and night um, um, in the, uh, under that shed, and um, it's, it's parts have come loose. So it's just um, when we read about um, Mr. Scalos, Mr. Callis's um, bill, um, we contacted our city council member and just thought that um, we have, you know, this is one of those classic cases where we feel like it's just, it, it is cheaper for the owner to keep extending this permit, which he has done. Sometimes um, it was behind and he probably had to pay the fine, but then it was extended and the latest is that until, it's now up until 2000 and, uh, uh, no, May next year. And it's a luxury rental building, so it's not a building that's empty or um, doesn't generate any income for the owner. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm here to speak about the infant changing station. Uh, I support the legislation, but I don't believe it goes far enough to protect the health and safety of children today. My name is Dale Frederick. Just over two years ago, my husband and I adopted our daughter. As a same-sex male couple, we were required to either use the men's changing room or endure unpleasant confrontations with women uncomfortable in our, with our presence in the ladies' room. In some occasions, we were directed by the operators of various facilities to only use the men's room. While we could have challenged these issues in the moment, having a crying baby in soiled di diapers made that impractical. This is not something that you should have to endure as a parent. Either individually or together, we had to change our daughter's diaper while she laid in our lap as we sat on a toilet in a stall, while we tried to avoid keeping her from falling on the floor or her products from falling on the floor. 
on other occasions, we went to a department store where we were required to uh, have them close the women's changing station so that we can use the disability stall in order to change our daughter. Sometimes when the, the stalls in the men's room were either too dirty or too small, we were forced to change our diaper at a dinner table or inside the backseat of our, cor our car. And as our daughter got older and less compliant with diaper changes, as children do, it went from being difficult to dangerous as she would twist and squirm in our lap. This is also something, not parent, something that parents should not have to endure. It is important for single fathers, for same-sex male couples, and heterosexual married couples where fathers are taking responsibility that this legislation goes beyond just future renovations and modifications, but addresses the issues of parents today. Um, it's an excellent start, but it's just not enough. We need to change an old, archaic law that, that emphasizes a misogynistic practice and is at its heart discriminatory. And I ask this court to pass this legislation for the future, but to think about expanding it to deal with issues that fathers are facing today. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Kevin Dugan, and I'm the Director of Government Affairs for the New York State Restaurant Association, and we represent uh, food and beverage establishments both here in New York City and across the state. Uh, I'm here today to voice the industry's support for Intro 1389 and applaud Council Members Kalos and Williams for bringing forth this important piece of legislation. The bars and restaurants that call this great city home face some of the most stringent regulations and steepest costs of any industry in the United States. Uh, rents are higher than ever before and labor costs continue to grow every year. Uh, running a restaurant is harder than ever and every single dollar that has taken on an unprecedented, every single dollar has taken on an unprecedented level of importance and is vital in the city of New York is taking the needed steps to ease some of this pressure on this uh, important industry. For years, scaffolding has been a significant problem for restaurants in New York. Oftentimes, these immense structures go up, shielding storefronts from pedestrians is insignificantly hurting a restaurant's ability to attract walk-up business. Uh, for example, a member restaurant in our association has estimated that scaffolding cut into his business upwards of 30% when it was out in front of his restaurant. Uh, he was able to ride out the storm, as it were, but many restaurants are not. It is harder than ever before to recover from a bad month, and many eateries are simply not able to survive when their businesses experience a loss like this. The most frustrating aspect of this for many owners is the fact that they have little to no control over the process. Uh, landlords are the ones who are working with companies on what type of work is getting done and how long these structures may be in place. Uh, restaurants find themselves at the mercy of these companies and complaints almost always fall on deaf ears as there is no impetus for change, uh, financial or otherwise. Um, it's rare that our organization calls for more regulation and greater government oversight, but in this instance, it is sorely needed. Uh, we need your help when monitoring when scaffolding has been up for too long without any work being done. It is simply a financial killer and a complaint that I hear constantly from our membership. Uh, in conclusion, the New York State Restaurant Association supports Intro 1389 and urges the council to look f for further ways to ensure that scaffolding remains up as short a for a short period of time as possible, uh, and we look forward to working with the council going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Andrew Ridgey. I am the executive director of the New York City Hospitality Alliance. We are a trade association that represents restaurants and nightlife establishments throughout the five boroughs. I want to thank the chair and council member uh, for this legislation and kind of bring the other side of the store into the equation. Obviously, public safety is of the utmost importance not just for all of the pedestrians, but also those people that are working inside of the restaurants and bars uh, where the scaffolding may be uh, constructed. Put in perspective what the impact is on the small business community, uh, it's pretty devastating when scaffolding goes up, and especially when it is left up unnecessarily, and we have reason to believe that in cases it is left up longer than it should or needs to be. Last year, we conducted a survey of about 100 restaurants throughout the city uh, in partnership with the Department of Small Business Services. Really quickly, we asked members, how long was the sidewalk uh, shed or scaffolding up? About 18% said up to six months. About 13% of those businesses said that it was up for at least one year. Uh, we then asked, did you receive prior notification that the construction would be uh, done and sidewalk scaffolding would be constructed? About 40% of those businesses said no, so they were not able to anticipate. Um, we asked about a loss of revenue uh, to, to businesses when scaffolding goes up. 
about 42% of those businesses said that their revenue was reduced about 25% due to scaffolding. Another almost 33% of those businesses said that their revenue dropped between 25 and 50%. What other impacts did the scaffolding have? Some of the things that were mentioned. Obviously, the negative appearance. And we're talking about this discussion. Perhaps there's a way to make the scaffolding a little bit more attractive. Right now, it's pretty ugly to look at. Some other issues. May I go on for another 30 seconds? You can give a closing uh, Perfect. sentence. So just at the end of the day, we understand this is a complex issue. But businesses, especially our small businesses, are suffering because of scaffolding. There has to be a way, and we believe there are some very good ideas uh, in this legislation, and we're happy to be part of the discussion to ensure that scaffolding is not left up unnecessarily. And if business owners are, or I should say landlords, are keeping the scaffolding up for a longer amount of time that's needed because they cannot afford it, I think these are things that should be explored. Finally, I would say there are other complaints that I've heard from businesses in which they feel scaffolding is left up because – it reduces their business and in a way can push them out of business for another type of business to come in maybe that can pay a higher rent. Scaffolding as harassment. Thank you. Hey, I'm Rob Bookman. I'm the uh, counsel to the uh, alliance and partner in a small firm and representing thousands of small businesses over the decades. Most, I like to listen you know, to the, to the questions and the comments and and then comment on that. And I thought that, Mr. Chairman, your comment was the most telling today, saying, you know, maybe some, you know, we expect landlords to be able to take care of their buildings. We expect it inside and outside. It's not acceptable for a landlord to say, well, an elevator is unsafe or a stairway is unsafe, so we're just going to close it off indefinitely, and I don't have the money for it, so I'm never going to fix it. We wouldn't accept that there. Why do we accept it here? This is not just a quality of life issue for small businesses. You heard some of the numbers here. It's life and death for small businesses. Uh, if you have a sidewalk cafe, as we say in Brooklyn, just forget about it. You're, 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 you, that's completely gone. Nobody wants to sit under a scaffolding. So, we, you know, we, we need to look at this carefully. Council members are always asking, how do we help small businesses? Well, this is one way to help, you know, perhaps thousands of small businesses. You know, the uh, building department said 8,843 shed permits up now. 25% are because of Local Law 11. That's about 2,200 buildings, yet only 975 were deemed unsafe under that law in, in 2015. He said another 912 so far in this next cycle. That means these things are never coming down under Local Law 11. You know, we probably have, from the 2010 cycle up, you know, we, still have, we still have sheds. So they're never coming down. It's just nonsense. And... Um, we, we need to dig down deeper into, to borrow some of the language from Rebney, did Local Law 11 itself in 1998 create a problem by swatting a fly with a sledgehammer? You know, where it looks like we're trying to create what's the solution, but maybe the local law itself is the problem, and we need to look at that a little bit. I'm not comfortable, by the way, with uh, what I heard today, that it's private contractors that make that decision about whether it's unsafe or not, not a New York City inspector who has no potential economic conflict of interest. Would anybody be shocked, shocked, shocked if some of these private contractors that make that determination get referral fees from shed companies? I wouldn't be. Uh, I'm sure you wouldn't be. So, I mean, there's, there's a structure here that we have to look at. That nobody wants unsafe but this is, we've, you've heard enough to, say, to know today that that's not the issue anymore. And I'm not convinced that all these are, are in fact, unsafe. Thank you very much uh, for, for all of your testimony. Uh, Mr. Frederick, um, thank you for your testimony on 1241 and giving a uh, uh, personal um, perspective. But your testimony seemed to imply that you were saying the bill only will apply to future um, buildings? Maybe I'm mistaken, but my reading of it seems to indicate it's for uh, new construction and renovation, not for existing businesses now. Well, I just confirmed. So we, we our understanding is that it is for, for existing buildings as well. Yeah, I won't. So did that, did that deal with all the concerns? That, that you if, it, if it actually addresses the existing businesses now and requires that they do that everywhere, then yes, that addresses my concern. Thank you, and thank you so much for coming in for the testimony. I know that my colleague has some questions, so we're going to give five minutes for Councilman Michaelos to ask his questions. 
I want to thank uh, everyone on this panel. Uh, I, I, no one should have to go through what you went through in terms of trying to change their child, and so support that legislation. I want to thank uh, New York State Restaurant Association and uh, the New York City Hospitality Alliance for coming together on this legislation. And so uh, I, I had a chance to meet with both of your memberships, and so when scaffolding goes up, does that have a financial impact on uh, restaurants on the first floor and hospitality uh, establishments? The, th the financial impact? Uh, certainly. I mean, just read with some of the statistics, you know, the, almost I think it was 40 percent see um, uh, drop between 25 and 50 percent. And one thing to add to that, uh, this is not just a small business issue. It's also an employee issue. One of the uh, pieces of data I did not get to in my testimony, we asked the question is, uh, did the sidewalk shed slash scaffolding impact your business enough that you had to reduce employee hours or eliminate jobs? The respondents, 50 percent of respondents said yes, reduced employee hours, 39.74, almost 40 percent said yes, reduced jobs. So this is also an employment issue in addition to being a small business issue. Where can I get a copy of that survey? I will get it for you. Perfect. And if you're able to share it on your website, we usually ask government agencies, but if we're able to share it and perhaps even uh, we'll, we'll work together on getting this report out there, but I think these numbers are helpful. And to the Restaurant Association? Uh, yeah, a, a dramatic effect on uh, first, floor uh, first floor business. I mean, there's, there's the additional effect of not knowing that the establishment is there to begin with. Um, you know, there's been a debate about whether, you know, companies are allowed to have some sort of signage on, on the scaffolding itself to, to let folks know that their businesses are actually there. Countless neighborhoods in Manhattan um, where restaurants reside rely on tourism and walk-up business, as it were. Um, if you don't know something's there, you're not going to go. Um, so it has a dramatic effect on, on and, and so I was shocked to hear from the previous panel, which involved people from the Real Estate Board of New York, that the scaffolding is actually so cheap for three months. It was in the hundreds of dollars per foot. And so I guess w one question is, the landlords want to save money, so they're paying like three grand for 20 foot, for scaffolding to cover a 20 foot st uh, storefront. Does that three grand uh, have more than a three grand impact on the businesses? <laughs> and yes. perhaps I, I'm almost shocked, and I don't think it's been engaged, but whether or not a, if, I was a, if I was a business owner on the first floor with scaffolding, I would actually just say, I will give you the three grand if you just take the scaffolding down. I'll pay for it to go back down for just sure. so I can have it for three months over the summer. By a large multiplier. As a matter of fact, if you really you know, want to get these scaffoldings down, put in the bill that they have to reduce the, the rent of their commercial tenants uh, by a certain by 25 percent every month beyond the first 90 days that that scaffolding stays up. You'll see them come down pretty fast. Uh, so, qu so quick question: uh, as, a, as a fellow attorney, if you believe we as a city council are not precluded by Erstat on commercial law. Uh, and we can say that rents have to go, that, that it, there's a certain type of offense for which a tenant may bring a class, a, a suit. Uh, I, would, I would be so interested in doing so. Yeah, I'm not sure you could, I think you could create um, a cause of action for, a private cause of action, you, you know. For, get, get, I, get me specific you can't language. Regulate, and, you can't regulate the commercial rent, <laughs> but you could create a private cause of action uh, it, you know, in addition, you guys do it with, in, with New York City labor laws all the time. You know, uh, you're creating a private cause of action for both an agency to go after uh, a business and for private attorneys to go after a business. Uh, you, and this council in the last few years has passed a number of bills like that. That means you get me some language quickly. Also, just, just to reiterate, the Restaurant Association would also be in favor of such, uh, of such private right of action. So private cause of action, the damage would be lost revenue, and uh, the cause would be a failure to timely make repairs? Correct. And so the discovery would just revolve around, did the scaffolding go up before it was needed, and was there a reason why it couldn't come down? Okay, that is useful. Uh, are there any other specific changes or suggestions that you might have to make this even stronger or further benefit our... So one quick anecdote is because it's, it's, it's rare, but it's not always just a first floor tenant. One of our members wanted us to share this story that they just recently got noticed that the building next to them, not their building, 
uh, has to have put a scaffolding up. They have a very expensive, they're on the top of a building, yeah, and they have a very expensive glass enclosed that's able to open roof garden, which is their business. And th they were told that the scaffolding is going to have to cover their glass enclosed roof um, for at least another year with zero compensation to them. It's a, it will literally put them out of business. Uh, and so I guess, is there any cause, so when somebody puts up scaffolding and that scaffolding is going to infect your property, and I, that's one of the larger complaints, I think we have testimony on that that somebody submitted, uh, is there a process for saying, no, 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 don't put that here, or does there need to be a process so that a neighboring building that is subject to somebody else's scaffolding can actually come back and say, actually, we'd prefer within, as long as it doesn't cost more than 20 or a certain amount more, that you do an alternative remedy. Not only is there no process, uh, and their response to this, uh, this member uh, was, well, we've got to put it up, you know. But it seems to me that there should also be, if you're asking for ideas, an administrative process when this private contractor makes the determination under the local law, unsafe scaffolding goes up, with no level of evidence, no administrative hearing. There should be a way for interested parties, that could be the building owner, it could be commercial tenants, to be able to go to an administrative hearing and have that contract approve it. You know, and maybe you can have your expert witness respond to show that. It seems to me that the default for these private contractors is to say it's unsafe because there's no liability to say it's unsafe. You failed. You know, but they may be a little worried about saying it otherwise. So there is no, you know, it's a private person making a decision that's going to, that affects lives and businesses for, as you said, sometimes as long as a decade, and there was no way to initially even challenge that determination. There would be, if a, if a building inspector gave you a violation, you get a right to have a hearing on the violation. All right. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you all for your testimony. I really appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you, guys. I, I believe, how many, for the record? Uh, testimony from RSA for the record and opposition of intro 1389. With that, this hearing is now closed.